Hi, Gigi from the RBA. This video is part of our series on monetary policy. In it, we're going to talk about short and longer term interest rates. So we need to return to interest rates so we can properly understand some of the unconventional tools the RBA uses to conduct monetary policy. Please watch our previous videos on interest rates, the cash rate, and bonds in the yield curve before proceeding with this video. So first, I want to talk about a concept we're going to refer to a lot over the next few videos, an asset. So an asset is just something of value. It's valuable because it provides its owner with a future benefit. For example, a house is an asset. The future benefit a house provides to its owner is shelter or rental income if they decide to rent it out. The value of the house measures the size of that benefit as agreed by the owner and a purchaser in the marketplace. A house is a physical asset because we can see and touch it. In finance, an asset is a promise from someone to pay you money in the future. The money is the benefit you receive. A financial asset is different to a physical asset because you can't really see it, it's just a promise. So an asset has something called a yield. The yield measures the future benefit the asset is expected to provide over a specific time period, such as each year, compared with the purchase price. Yields are often expressed as an interest rate. An example of a financial asset is your money on deposit at the bank, which is just a promise by the bank to provide you with your money. The money provides you a benefit in the future when you withdraw it to spend, or if you leave it in the bank to earn interest. The yield on your deposit, which remember is your asset, is measured by its interest rate. The interest rate captures the interest income you expect to receive over a year, the future benefit to you, compared to the size of your deposit. So participants in financial markets trade many different financial assets every day, and their value or price depends on the laws of supply and demand among other things. Because the yield on an asset depends on the price someone can purchase it for today, what we call the market price, an asset's yield changes as its price does. Financial assets will be very important for our discussion of unconventional policy tools over the coming videos. So now we need to learn a bit more about interest rates. So we've already talked about the cash rate as an important reference point for other interest rates in the economy. We also said that the cash rate wasn't the only thing that influences interest rates and that other things matter as well, including whether interest rates are variable or fixed. These two issues are key to understanding how unconventional policies work. So let's talk more about variable and fixed interest rates. Remember, a fixed interest rate is locked in once it's set for a fixed period of time. To understand fixed rates, it's easiest to compare them with variable interest rates. Let's talk through an example. So suppose a business wants to save some money at the bank for two years. They have to make a decision about whether to save at a fixed rate or at a variable rate. If they choose the fixed rate deposit, then the interest rate the bank offers them today will be the interest rate they receive over the whole two years. To make things simple, let's say that the interest rate the bank offers them to is the cash rate today. If they choose the variable rate deposit, which is the next best option, the interest rate the bank offers them today could change tomorrow and each day after that over the next two years. Under this option, let's say the interest rate they receive is equal to whatever the cash rate is each day over the next two years. So the interest rate they'll receive will change if the cash rate does. However, the business has to decide today what it's going to do it doesn't know what the cash rate will be over the next two years. However, if it chooses the fixed rate option, the bank will lock in today's cash rate for the next two years. So what this means is that the business's expectations today for the cash rate over the next two years matter for deciding which option it should choose. The business expects that choosing the fixed option will pay a higher interest rate than choosing the variable option, then it will choose the fixed option. So this example shows that more generally, a fixed rate can be broken down into a combination of a variable rate today and a decision maker's expectations for that variable rate tomorrow and every subsequent day until the end of the fixed rate period. So I've shown this on the diagram. So this means that the opportunity cost between fixed rates and variable rates changes every time decision makers change their expectations for variable rates in the future. So returning to our example, Suppose the bank's best guess is that the cash rate will stay the same over the next two years. 
and so it set the fixed rate option equal to the cash rate. But suppose the business expects the cash rate to decrease over the next two years. The business would then choose the fixed rate option because this is the option it expects will give it the highest interest rate. But what if the business made the wrong call? What if the cash rate actually increased? If the business had chosen the variable rate option, it would have received a higher interest rate. But how is it supposed to know that the cash rate would increase? It made its best prediction and chose the fixed rate option based on what it expected to happen to the cash rate over the next two years. So the whole point of this example is that the future path of interest rates is uncertain. This uncertainty is always embedded in fixed interest rates. Once an interest rate is locked in, there's always the chance that the future could turn out differently than expected and someone is worse off as a result. So the longer an interest rate is fixed for, the greater this uncertainty is because the future is more uncertain the further away it is. In the real world, lenders or savers of money will require a premium to be added to fixed rates to protect them against this uncertainty. The premium is usually larger the longer the interest rate is fixed for to compensate for more uncertainty. In financial markets, we call this the term premium. So where do unconventional monetary policy tools come into the picture? Well, one way these tools can work is by influencing expectations about future interest rates, including the future cash rate, to affect how lenders of money set fixed rates. They can also affect some fixed interest rates directly. They also work by reducing uncertainty about whether interest rates will rise in the future, and so reduce the premium we just spoke about. So now that we know about fixed interest rates, let's take a look at some fixed rates that are equivalent, in terms of being as close as possible to risk-free, to the cash rate. But before we continue, in financial markets, rather than talking about variable and fixed rates, we tend to talk instead about short and longer term rates. Really though, they are the same thing, right? Short term rates are very similar to variable rates and longer term rates are like fixed rates. So we'll switch to using that language now. So to measure longer term risk-free interest rates, we can use something called the risk-free yield curve. The yield curve plots the yield on government bonds over different periods of time, called terms. Government bonds are just a promise by the government to pay an investor some money it has borrowed in the future often for a longer term. In other words, they're a financial asset, like we discussed earlier. A government bond yield measures the benefit an owner of the bond expects to receive each year from owning it, relative to its market price. The yield is expressed as an interest rate. Government bond yields are the closest thing in financial markets to longer term, risk-free interest rates. There's a whole video on bonds in the yield curve presented by my colleague Kate. Please watch this video to understand the yield curve. So the yield curve is a very important bridge for unconventional monetary policy tools to transmit to longer term interest rates. Let's unpack why. So remember before we broke down longer term interest rate into a combination of a short term interest rate today and expectations of that same short term rate for the future. Applying the same thinking and keeping in mind that government bond yields are considered risk free Part of a government bond yield is just a combination of the cash rate today and expectations for the cash rate in the future. So, by influencing expectations about the future value of the cash rate, monetary policy tools can alter the yield curve. This is also why the cash rate is the shortest term on the yield curve. Changes in the cash rate up or down tend to move the whole yield curve up or down because of course the cash rate today has a powerful influence on what people expect the cash rate will be in the future. For this reason, we often say the yield curve is anchored by the cash rate. You can also see that these yield curves on the graph here slope upwards. One reason for this is the premium lenders of money apply to long-term interest rates over short-term interest rates, which remember, relates to their uncertainty about the future. By reducing this uncertainty, unconventional monetary policy can alter the, also alter the yield curve. We'll talk more about this in the next video. So finally, let's talk about why using monetary policy tools to affect the yield curve is important. If you remember back to our video on conventional monetary policy, we said the cash rate was a reference point for other interest rates in the economy. 
borrowing rates for households or businesses, interest rates on savings accounts, and yields on financial assets. We also talked about some of the other factors that could affect interest rates. Well, to be more specific, because the cash rate is a short-term interest rate, it is an appropriate reference point for other short-term interest rates in the economy. For example, many Australian households have mortgages with variable interest rates, so the cash rate is important for them. In a similar way, the rest of the yield curve is used as a reference point for many longer-term interest rates in the economy. For instance, some Australian households borrow using fixed rate mortgages. Usually they lock in their interest rate for two to three years, so this part of the yield curve is important for them. On the other hand, firms and governments often wish to borrow for a much longer term, say five to ten years, so this part of the yield curve can be important for them. In other words, the yield curve measures risk-free interest rates and that first factor, whether interest rates are short or longer term. As a result, the yield curve affects many interest rates in the economy, and it's why we use our monetary policy tools to alter it. So that's all for this video. Next in this series, we'll look at some of the unconventional tools used by the RBA in response to the COVID-19 pandemic. See you next time.